Hello, my name is Arnaud Delorme, and uh, this is a series on independent component analysis applied to EEG time series. This is part six on the reproducibility of ICA decomposition. If we run ICA several times on very similar data, is it going to give the same solution? So to test that idea, we run ICS several times. So we had two subjects and each subject they came 11 times to the lab. So we have 11 times about an hour of data for each subject. So we wanted to know if we run ICA on the data from the different days, do we get similar decomposition or do we get different decomposition? How reproducible is it across days? And uh, we pre-process the data, filter the data, and then run Infomax ICA on each of the data set. And then we use a special technique to uh, find the components which were common across data sets and for this we use the core map plugin of EEG lab which was developed by Stefan Debener's group so the picture over there is, is how this plugin works it, it looks complex on the picture it's actually just looking at correlation of scalp topographies and I'm going to show you example of components we got on one of the subjects so here for example so we had 11 sessions. So here for, we got this, this good, we got the component for the 11 sessions. And uh, here you can see the, so the top scalp topography is the average. And then we have the scalp topography on each of the session. And uh, some of them are inverted. And as we saw in uh, one of the previous presentation, this doesn't really matter because if you, uh, if you multiply by minus one, the scalp topography and multiply by minus one, the IC activity, it cancels out. So, so it doesn't matter that they're inverted. It just means the IC activity is also inverted. What's interesting is that the, scalp top, the, the power spectrum for two of these components was very different. And it might be for these specific subjects that we had several components, uh, IC components splitting the activity. Uh, from this uh, brain region. The cluster was relatively tight. Here is another example. These are the blinks. So here you see very similar components in the 11 sessions recorded on different days uh, uh, from these subjects. The power spectrum is very similar and the localization as well. Here, this is the left mu rhythm. This is a rhythm that's called a mu because you get, it's like in the power spectrum, you get this letter M. And again, most of the components are similar, but we have one that's a little bit of an outlier with lower uh, power. Uh, here is another example. This is now the right mu rhythm. And now we only have seven out of 11 sessions. So we couldn't find it in all the sessions. And it's unclear why they can be fine in some sessions and some others. Uh, it might be that in some sessions more artifact dominates, so it can't find these components. And uh, here is another one. This is left alpha rhythm. And, uh, and we can see we could find this one in six of the 11 session. And finally, here we have a, a nice central, very sharp alpha peak, but we could only find this one in four of the session. So to assess the quality of these clusters, uh, we work with a researcher whose name is Fiorenzo Artoni, and he developed a method that's called Bootstrap ICA. So you just take the data, it's always the same data from the subject, but you just take a sample of the data and you run ICA multiple times. And again, this is for the Infomax uh, ICA, although this has be, also been tried for the Amica uh, decomposition. And when you do several this, for instance, you run 1,000 times ICA, which components are stable and which components are not stable. And again, for Infomac, this is not a deterministic algorithm in the sense that every time you run it, you start from a different uh, uh, weight matrix. The weight matrix is randomized. If you use the same randomization, you're going to get the same result. But usually you use different randomization of the weight matrix. So every time you run uh, Infomax, it's going to give you slightly different results. So this is what's shown here. And this is a 2D uh, uh, projection uh, of uh, the components in multi-dimensional space. And we can see different clusters of, uh, of components, uh, right mu rhythm, left mu rhythm, uh, the, the scads, etc. So let's, let's look at some of these. So this is, for example, IC9. And for each component, we have a quality metric. So the quality is the cluster. 
is the tightness of the cluster in the previous image. How tight were, were these data points? Then we have the dipolarity, which we talked about in the previous uh, video. And we have the variance, how much variance of the data this explains. So we, we see, for instance, for this component, it explains about 4% of variance of the data. Uh, dipole fit is about 99%. The reserve variance is less than 1%. And the quality is very tightly clustered across the multiple runs. Uh, here are some other ones. And we can see, for example, IC3 has some kind of bimodal distribution. So the dipolarity is not always, uh, always very uh, at the highest, at about 95%. Uh, for instance, IC10, which is likely to represent more of a, a line noise artifact, even though it's uh, very tightly clustered, 98%. So you can see the dipolar, it's not very uh, dipolar, but it explains a lot of the data, about 30%. And then we have many other components. Some have lower quality index, like 86%, 92%. So we, this tells us how uh, the different components we can get, and if we can get some components which are reliable or not. And now we come to this slide about the reliability criteria. And when we do group analysis, we usually set a threshold at 15% for the residual variance. We said any component which doesn't have an equivalent dipole with less than 50%, let's not consider it. And here, uh, in this paper, we found some rational for uh, this number because we found three classes of components. We have components with uh, very high dipolarity, so above 85%. Here it's 100% uh, it's, uh, minus the residual variance. And then we have class two, which have uh, a, quality, a high quality index, and, but uh, various uh, uh, dipolarities. So this is like the blue component I showed you in the previous uh, slide. And we have class three, which are all the components which have low quality index. What's very interesting here is that if you look, when they have low quality index, that's the uh, red box here, you don't have any components with low quality index and which are not uh, at least 85% dipolar. So if you're 85% dipolar, you usually have a high, relatively high quality index. And there were 14 data sets, so you can see it varies, the classes varies uh, between data sets. Some data sets have more of one class uh, versus the other. So this is the end of this presentation and I'll see you on the next one.